Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Patrick McNamara. He's an associate professor of neurology at the PU School of Medicine and professor of psychology at National University, and also a director of the Cognitive Neuroscience of Religion project, along with Jordan Grafman. And today we're going to focus on his book, The Cognitive Neuroscience of Religious Experience, Decentering and the Self. So, Dr. McNamara, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to meet you too, Ricardo. I love your show. I've seen some of your other episodes. They're fantastic. So, thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. So, uh, getting into the topic then, uh, why would you say we should use neuroscience to study religion? I mean, basically, what does it add to the picture and what makes it a good or a proper tool of study in this case? I mean, why not use it? We need all the help we can get to study this massive thing called religion. So, I mean, they're, they're, neuroscience has a great toolbox of ways uh, to approach phenomena, so why not use neuroscience? We've used everything else to try to understand religion and not gotten so far, I don't think. so. Neuroscience can help, but um, I go a step further and say we need neuroscience because uh, I think um, the brain is really what constrains and shapes the phenomenology of religious experience itself. So the reason why we have the, the features we have with religious experience is because we have the kind of brain and brain processes we have. So there's no way to understand religious experience without tapping into what we know about the brain um, and using neuroscience tools to explore religious experience. Of course, we will get into the details later on in the interview, but generally speaking, how would religious experiences manifest in the brain? Uh, <clears throat> um, well, the default hypothesis would be that they'd manifest just like any other type of experience. However, uh, I think evidence is accumulating that um, they have um, distinctive signatures, you might say. that uh, um, So um, they call upon or they recruit or they involve specific sets of neural circuits that um, we, we see repeatedly involved when people undergo religious experiences or engage in religious cognition. And these are these networks come up over and over again, not just in religious experience, but in all kinds of other domains, but they seem particularly engaged with religious experience. And they are the salience network, so-called salience network, the default mode network, and the frontal parietal executive control network. These three hubs of activity, you might say, are repeatedly come up in neuroimaging studies of um, uh, religious experience. So, uh, and do you do you use any particular definition of religion? Because I know that's a contentious topic, even among cognitive scientists of religion. For example, I mean, it's not easy at all. It seems to define religion or religious experiences. So, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very fraught topic, and I mean, uh, scholars have debated it for over a century, you know, um, and it, with good reason. I mean, the, uh, religiosity um, is expressed in myriad different ways uh, across cultures and across time epochs, so it seems kind of silly to reduce it to just one essence. It seems almost impossible. However, um, I think most scholars and scientists would agree that um, if you use a sort of Wittgensteinian family resemblance approach, a few elements come up over and over again. And the, the ones that I concentrate on in the book are um, ritualistic interactions with supernatural agents. That's how I basically define religion. So rituals and supernatural agents, those are the key ingredients, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. And so, how would you define a supernatural agent? It's a, um, uh, typically it's a disembodied 
mind or it's a it's an agent who has intentional states but you don't you often don't see them they have super normal powers so they have powers beyond the typical human being uh, and they elicit uh, um, intense affect or like intense fear or intense devotion or intense commitment from ordinary human agents so they're they're unusual agents they can be embodied though as in the case of the divine kings from past epics but typically they're disembodied like god angels demons so forth mm -hmm. so getting into some general questions before we get into really the details of what you explore in the book because these are things that, that I try to ask every single religious scholar that I or, 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 or scholars on religion that I have on the show. Uh, so what would you say are the relative roles of biological and cultural evolution in religious thinking and behavior? Um, you, you absolutely have to um, bring in cultural evolution to understand. Uh, religious change, religiosity, religious experience, it seems to me. But you can't neglect the biological side of things either. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously both co contribute. There, there's reason to believe that um, uh, certain uh, forces in brain evolution are particularly important. For example, there's a whole hypothesis in evolutionary biology about self-domestication uh, process in the human species, where uh, aggressive impulses are gradually reduced and executive control processes are and that allows for cooperation among uh, human beings and that process seems to be particularly important when understanding how uh, religiosity affects the brain and how uh, cumulative cultural evolution affects the brain and vice versa so there's no understanding social learning capacities in human beings without understanding that kind of brain evolutionary process because it increases plasticity for for example in brain circuits and you can't have learning without or the kinds of learning that cultural learning that humans engage in without uh, a significant degree of plasticity in uh, brain functions mm -hmm. there's another very contentious question debate among uh, people who study religion scientifically that is are we innately predisposed to religiosity yeah another really complicated question that hasn't been studied enough uh, I, I would I would suggest that we are although the evidence is 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 weak on the other hand um, I think most scholars would agree that uh, children start to postulate supernatural agents without even being instructed about them. I mean, it's hard to do a good experiment, obviously, because most kids are immersed in cultures that believe in supernatural agents. Mm -hmm. However, even in families where that's not the case, children tend to develop conceptions about supernatural agents. So, And there, there is some evidence that religiosity as a trait, personality trait, is inheritable so there you know there's some evidence to suggest an innate predisposition for religiosity mm -hmm. but it's weak it's weak it's under mm -hmm. under investigated yeah uh, in the book when it comes to the biological foundations let's say of religion one of the things you talk about is sexual conflict so what is it and what role does it play in religious behavior Yes, um, I think it's a, it plays a particularly important role, um, and it's a, a, again it's underappreciated role. But what sex, sexual conflict is 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 simply that the, the two sexes um, have different genetic interests at uh, crucial points in the life history of a human being. So because of these different genetic interests, they have different strategic goals at each point in life history. And sometimes those goals mesh and we cooperate and sometimes they don't and then there's conflict so um, there's there's reason to believe that um, um, 
genes that are inherited down the matrial line, down the maternal line, code for uh, brain structures that are more near neocortical, whereas genes inherited down the paternal line code for uh, brain structures that are sort of subcortical, more limbic oriented. Uh, the, the evidence is there. It's 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 not that strong, but it's there. Um, and uh, so, um, genetic conflict is expressed right at the level of the brain. You know, so um, it's going to be expressed in religiosity as well because it's expressed right at the level of brain function. And there's a whole there's a whole literature on how how it, it, it's expressed in religiosity. As well, which we can get into if you want. But mm -hmm. uh, so, in the book, you use or at least refer to what you call the four E framework. That is, the mind as embodied, enacted, embedded, and extended. Could you explain that? Yeah, I think that's another um, set of ideas and assumptions that I think religion scholars need to take on board because. Um, Religiousness uh, and 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 whenever you talk about uh, brains contributions to religiousness, you have to keep that stuff in mind because the brain and the the mind do not stop at our skin. You know, um, of course it's the brain is the brain, but the mind extends way beyond our skin into our tools, our everyday tools and so forth, uh, like our smartphones or our computers or laptops, whatever. And so uh, um, it's a, it's important to keep that in mind, so that you can you can also um, link that up with cultural evolutionary processes as well, social learning processes. There's no understanding re religion without bringing in culture, and the 4E framework does that naturally and seamlessly. It seems to me. There's constraints on it, though. We don't want to say that. The brain is infinitely plastic, so it, it, it can operate with any cultural instantiation. I mean, it's, it does have its structures and its operating principles, but nonetheless, uh, culture can really shape what it, um, how the brain expresses its functions. So um, the 4E framework helps us to understand that. Mm -hmm. Earlier, earlier I've asked you about the relative contributions of biology and culture to religion. Would you say that religion might also play a role in gene culture coevolution and influence the and influence genetic evolution and, for example, the evolution of particular cognitive abilities? Yeah, I think I, I think so. I mean, um, an obvious example is that. Um, um, Religions, uh, many religions, um, have a lot to say about reproductive behaviors. You know, they're very concerned with with uh, marriage and sex and so on. So uh, the vast majority of religions that evolved during the axial age seem to promote um, 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 monogamy and um, a slow life history where you invest a lot into few offspring instead of um, investing into many offspring. And so if you invest a lot in just a couple of off offspring, um, that that coheres with a set of religious doctrines that you see in, in many world religions. So they seem to have an interest in promoting that kind of life history traje trajectory. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's appropriate for certain certain ecological environments you know when you have more predictable environments that kind of life history uh, strategy is more beneficial if you have more chaotic environments then you want to go to a different type of life history strategy mm -hmm. would you say that religion is essentially a social phenomenon well it's definitely a groupish phenomenon it, you know it, it um, down through the ages, it's always manifested as a group phenomenon. However, it's it's uh, it's uh, it also performs all these amazing individual level functions um, like self transformation. However, that 
those self-transformational processes are always interlinked with um, group demands and group functions. But uh, there are theories of the evolution of religion that suggest that um, one of religion's main functions is to promote cooperation within the group. So uh, religion is always bound up with groupish phenomena. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned their uh, transformation or transformative phenomenon, phenomena, uh, at a certain point in the book you talk about religion as, at, as a transformational technology. What do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it refers to the fact that a lot of people use religious practices to transform their selves. To be, I mean, from their point of view or the religion's point of view, it's to become a better self, a more ideal self, and they use religious practices to do so. Now, uh, at at the neurological level, I I present evidence and argue that what appears to be involved when when you engage in religious practices is a process called decentering. A lot of uh, neuroscientists call decentering, and that's that essentially refers to sort of a, a down-regulation of um, the executive self, you might say, and and then a linking up of, and then an editing of a new form of that self into a new model of the self, and then linking it up with an ideal self. So there's the, it's a dynamic process. Religious cognition is dynamic. It's constantly repetitive. Uh, repairing the sense of self so that it better approximates an ideal self. That's when religion is operating well. When it's not operating well, it could us of the self in such a way as to um, facilitate binding with a cult leader, let's say, or some, you know, uh, demonic form of the self. You know, so um, religion is a very powerful way to transform the sense of self and identity. Mm -hmm. and it does all, it through that decentering process, I think. Yeah, and, and how does this decentering occur? Does it follow steps, for example? Yeah, uh, those uh, those kind of steps I just alluded to. Um, the first the, the first step is typically um, uh, the sense of agency gets down regulated. And then um, uh, the person feels immersed in this liminal space. Um, and then there's a linking up with a, a more computationally efficient sense of self. You know, so it's just sort of a common sense way to um, um, edit your sense of self so that um, you grow psychically. And uh, from the predictive processing framework, which I allude to in the book and, and utilize in the book. What appears to be going on is, you know, the, the topmost predictive model. See, the predictive processing framework sees our brain functions as essentially a prediction machine. So we're constantly building predictive models of the of the world, what to expect next. And at the top, and there's a hierarchy of these models, these predictive models. And the topmost model is about the sense of self, and and um, that when when that sense of self does poorly in terms of predicting what's to expect next in the world, then obviously you need to update it, you know, to function in the world, and so you need a an updating process, and one of the ways that that sense of self is updated is through religious cognition and practices that we call the centering. Mm -hmm. And what is the divided self? The divided self emerges out of um, this predictive processing framework in one sense in, in that each the, 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 the bottom most models can conflict with the top most predictive models and so you get a conflicted self but also just genetically too, uh, genetic elements in our genome um, conflict with one another and that yields a bunch of conf conflicting impulses in the brain. So um, the, 
the self is just divided. I mean, one part of me wants to be, um, you know, thin and attractive, and another part of me wants to eat the piece of cake. You know, so there's there's always this uh, set of conflicts going on, and religion helps us um, overcome those conflicts and resolve them in a computationally efficient way, or when it's operating well, it does so. Does the divided self have any evolutionary basis? Uh, well, well um, again, uh, because of um, genetic conflict, uh, uh, I, th I think the di divided self reflects this um, genetic, con you know, our genomes are made up of all kinds of differing uh, selfish genetic elements that have competing interests. And that gets reflected in the in the neural architecture of the brain, and then and that gets reflected in the psyche. Um, so, you know, evolutionary um, processes just cobble together the best it can do an organism, and then that organism is composed of all kinds of competing uh, selfish elements, and then that creates a divided self, it seems to me. And so we need a solution. You know, if we're going to cooperate in a group and we're all divided about our um, intentional goals and so forth it's not going to work very well so you need you need some sort of transient unity at least you know some some you need to be able to sustain intentional goals for some period of time if you're going to have um, cooperation with other people so you need some sense of a unified self and um, you need a technology to create that unified self because evolution doesn't do it too well. And religion is one of those tools you can use. Mm -hmm. In the book, you establish a distinction between the phenomena of schizophrenia and hypermentalizing and the female psychology, and on the other hand, on the other hand, autism, hypomentalizing, and the male psychology. So. Why do you do that, and why is it, might it be relevant for us to understand religious thinking from a neuro, neuroscientific perspective? Yeah. Um, well, that um, that phenomena of the divergence and mentalizing between schizophrenics on one end of the spectrum and, au and autism uh, disorder, the other end of the spectrum, hyper and hypomentalizing. Was, has been noticed by many people, but in particular by Crespi and Badcock. And, um, but from a religiosity point of view, it's particularly interesting because schizophrenics tend to um, see agency in uh, disembodied minds and supernatural agents everywhere. And they tend to be, not all of them, but some of them tend to be very religious and maybe even hyper-religious, whereas um, autistics tend not to see agency everywhere. Um, they, they have a more systemizing mindset and engineering mindset, um, and um, they have a different form of supernatural agents that they postulate than the standard supernatural agents you see in other religions. And, and um, there's a male predominance in autism, and, and it's debated, but um, maybe a female predominance in schizophrenia, but that's very debated. Depends on the type of schizophrenia you're talking about. So you have these two different brains, so that the, the brain processes that are associated with schizophrenia are very different than the brain processes associated with autism. And so, obviously, you've got these two expressions of religiosity um, associated with hypermentalizing in one case, hypomentalizing in the other, as well as the sex differences and, and, and two different brain connectivity processes going on. So, obviously, that's going to be rel relevant to a neuroscience of religion. So um, it's a very rich data source for the neuroscience of religion, it seems to me. But interestingly enough, those three same networks that I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, the salience network, the um, executive control network, 
default mode network are the same three networks that are altered systematically in each disorder, but in sort of opposite ways, you might say. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if the sex differences in schizophrenia and autism are really established, then that would at least in part explain what we tend to find across societies when it comes to sex differences in religiosity, that is, women tend to be more prone to religiosity than men? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a data point that <laughs> needs to be taken into account to explain that phenomenon. However, it's um, uh, the women predominance in religion is is not really, uh, it doesn't occur across all societies. Uh, so there, so in some Muslim societies, men are more predominant in religion than in others. And also there, there's more nuance there, like uh, women are more predominant in, um, um, when, when it comes to uh, doctrine and doctrinal um, precepts and stuff like that, whereas men tend to be more drawn to ecstatic expressions of religiosity. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a much more nuanced picture than just saying women are more religious. Yeah. Uh, and since we're talking about cross-cultural studies, how does the notion of agency vary cross-culturally? Mm. I think religion is particularly interested in this notion of um, agency, because agency is so critical to um, the sense of responsibility, taking responsibility for one's actions. You can't have um, a legal system in a traditional sense without some sense of agency. So um, religions and political cultures in general are very interested in the scopes and bounds of the sense of agency. and religious culture in particular is extremely interested in it and it tends to create all kinds of devices to either expand that sense of agency in some situations or contract it and so it the sense of agency is a site of political and religious conflict constantly down through the ages and um, the the brain mediation of the sense of agency is uh, a very complicated issue, but there is a literature on that, and um, and it overlaps with um, what we repeatedly see when we do neuroimaging studies of um, religiosity and religious experience. So it's a I'm painting a very complex picture there. There's no simple answers, but it's central to religious con consciousness and the brain and religion um, enigma, you might say. Um, talking about the divided self, does it connect in any way to social cooperation? And if so, how? I, I think it does. Um, as I was trying to say earlier, um, religion um, is, is a sort of a neurotechnology that can help um, solve the issue of the divided self. And if you're gonna have group cooperation, you need, it, you need individuals who have some executive control over and, and some sense of agency and, and intentionality able to make long-term commitments to a group. So um, solving the divided self helps to solve the overall issue of group cooperation in the culture seems to me. So that's one way um, it's connected with uh, religiosity and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, getting into executive control now, why is it important to consider it from the perspective of the neuroscience of religion? I mean, what role does it play here? Um, uh, it plays many roles. I mean, uh, uh, one thing is, uh, for example, in, in all, not all, but in most instances of religious experience, take psychedelics, for example. Most people agree that a certain percentage of people who take a psychedelic uh, 
have what they term is a spiritual and religious experience. Mm -hmm. One of the main components of the mystical experience and, and after taking a psychedelic is a reduction in executive control. And sometimes um, you get ego dissolution completely. So executive control is just abolished. And then that that's that's the first step in the decentering process. So the way executive control is linked to religious cognition is that's one way. It's the first step in the decentering process. Uh, another way that executive control is linked to religion is that first step. That, the first step is a uh, is a down regulation of executive control and agency, but then it links you up with a more ideal self, and a strong, and then ultimately a stronger sense of executive control. Now, religion wants us, wants individuals, to to have this uh, very strong executive control because it helps you to control impulses helps you to make long-term commitments so that you can be a good group member. And I mean, for example, you want people with strong executive control if you want them to fight, you know, the out group, for example, be good, um, capable warriors fighting an out group, for example, or just to co cooperate with within the group. You need people with good executive control capacities. So, so religion does that by First, by going through the decentering process, first down regulating executive control and then up regulating again with a more complete, more enhanced sense of self and a better sense, uh, sense of executive control and agency. Mm -hmm. I think we've already touched a little bit on this topic when early in our conversation we talked about biological and cultural evolution and more specifically about how religion might uh, play a role in gene culture coevolution. But is there a relationship between religion and specifically cumulative cultural evolution? Um, uh, I, I think, I think um, religiosity promotes cumulative cultural evolution. I mean, I think most scholars would agree that cumulative cultural evolution is what helped the human species really take off and develop technology and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, because you obviously can build from generation to generation. And I think um, religion facilitated that process precisely in doing what we were just saying, and that is um, increasing the number of individuals in a population with that strong executive control. That's one way. And also just at, at a neural basis, increasing the plasticity of the brain. And that, that's a long involved story, but um, you see that, occur you see it most clearly occurring in a psychedelic state, for example. Uh, but, but basically when, when you, when you um, downregulate um, agency in the sense of self and executive control, default mode network is is down regulated you get um, um, much more um, plasticity in the brain and if you require the brain to process uh, high what what it considers to be highly meaningful information then it, it it basically produces more cells to do so it increases its plasticity to do so and religion has traditionally been the area where intensely um, uh, informed, significant information is processed. That's where we get highly significant information is in the you know via the religious realm, and that forces the brain to up its game, you might say, create more uh, capacity to process that information. So it religion pushes the brain towards plasticity, you might say. <clears throat> and what are the cognitive mechanisms and brain correlates that are the most associated with religious experiences? Of course, in the book, you cover several different of them, several different ones, uh, like 
We talk about the predictive processing framework, temporal lobe epilepsy, frontotemporal dementing process, hippocampal atrophy, schizophrenia, we've already touched on that one, and obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. I don't know, would you like to tell us about each of them or perhaps just a general overview of what they are and how perhaps they might connect to each other? Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> there's a developing massive literature on um, changes in religiosity after changes in the brain. So the, <clears throat> the one way that I um, review the literature in the book is uh, divide them up into disorders associated with hyper-religiosity, mm -hmm. enhanced religiosity, and disorders associated with um, reduced religiosity. <clears throat> so some of the disorders, just to illustrate some of this stuff, some of the disorders associated with hyper-religiosity, interestingly, are things like temporal lobe epilepsy, only a small minority of those cases, by the way, not all of them. and um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. uh, some some branches, uh, some types of frontal temporal dementia, and some mm -hmm. types of schizophrenia. Yeah. And what's interesting is that in a, in several of these, what appears to be occurring is atrophy in the medial temporal lobe on the mm -hmm. right side. So here's a case where you get atrophy or loss of brain volume and loss of brain cells, literally, in a particular area, the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampal region, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you get enhanced function, in this case, enhanced religiosity. Well, what, in my view, what appears to be going on is what I was just alluding to. What See, because what the hippocampus does is in, in association with the REM sleep system. Mm -hmm. it, well, you, you have to conceive of the REM sleep system as a way that the brain processes highly significant information. It's the preferred system for processing emotionally significant information. So when that system it breaks down to some extent, you get a backlog of um, all this highly significant emotional information that needs to be processed. And so the brain knows that it has, it's, it's dealing, it's constantly dealing with highly significant emotional information that is typically interpreted in religious terms. And so the person becomes more religious. So that's what I think is going on with these disorders where you have um, hippocampal atrophy or medial temporal lobe atrophy, but enhanced religiosity. The brain is interpreting this backlog of information as highly significant. And so the person becomes kind of religious because they're forced to take these cosmic perspectives on this backlog of information that's not being efficiently processed through the REM sleep hippocampal system. I know that's a convoluted explanation, forgive me for that, but it's it's hard to simplify what I think is going on, but I think that's basically what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but then just another question related to that. Yeah, so we have hyper-religiosity, and yeah. apparently yeah. all of these brain conditions and mental disorders are connected yes. to it. So how should we think about the connection there? Is it that someone has to have uh, all of these brain issues to be hyper-religious, just a few of them? Is, is it that just one of them might be enough? I mean, how oh, yeah, is the correct way of thinking about it? Uh, um, well, <clears throat> you can get to be hyper-religious in many... I, I think the fundamental way to get to be extremely religious mm -hmm. is to feel like you have to process an enormous amount of emotionally significant information. Okay. Okay, now, now, there's a couple of ways that that can happen. One way is you can go through a trauma, you know, or, or many people become religious when they face death, for example. But, but so, 
you have to process a, a huge amount of very important information. Mm. But it, but our brains are finite, and they, you know, and they can only do a little bit at a time through the REM sleep system. So whenever you have, whenever the individual feels like he or she has to process in, intensely significant stuff, they get more religious. Would be my way of putting it. Now, another way you can get in that situation is if the system that normally processes highly significant emotional information breaks down. Because what happens to all that information? It's still there, it's still in the system, but it's not being processed efficiently. And so they become more religious because that's the normal reaction to trying to process a ton of emotionally significant information. Now, all the brain disorders that I just mentioned, schizophrenia, temporal lobe epilepsy, OCD, uh, <clears throat> several of them involve hippocampal atrophy or medial temporal lobe atrophy. And that's a significant component of the REM sleep system. So when the REM sleep system breaks down for whatever reason, or if it becomes disinhibited so that it starts to invade waking con con consciousness, like it does in narcolepsy, for example, you tend to get a bit more religiosity. And that's why we see people with significant atrophy in that system becoming hyper-religious. Hyper that's, that's the argument I make in the book, and I think there's good evidence for it. Okay, I understand. So are there, are there any neurological disorders that decrease religiosity? Uh, interestingly, we haven't identified very many of them. The, 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 the two that I discuss in the book are, um, and both are controversial, is autism and one form of Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Uh, the form of Parkinson's disease that um, is associated with uh, some forms of reduced religiosity is called left onset Parkinsonism. So um, the disease can be, in, in some cases, it, it starts on one side of the body or the other. When it starts on the left side of the body, the, the right hemisphere it, um, undergoes um, more atrophy than the left. So it's in those cases, left onset Parkin, Parkinsonism, that some of those patients report reduced religiosity, some, not all. With respect to autism, autism, the initial study suggested some reduced religiosity, but it's, I think it'd be more precise to say that there's a different form of spirituality that you see in autism than the standard forms you see in other um, disorders and populations. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about psychedelic drugs, because there are several religious rituals where people use them across the globe, and also sometimes people just individually use them to get religious experiences intentionally or not, or they get them even if they don't want to have them intentionally. But what are their basically neurological effects? And so why do people use them in those contexts? <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think the, the work coming out of the lab studying psychedelic experiences is extremely important for uh, understanding uh, religiosity and brain topics. So um, what appears to be happening when you, when you do neuroimaging studies of people on a psychedelic, particularly the serotonergic psych psychedelics, those are the ones that have been best studied. And what appears to be going on is once again we have the involvement of those three networks in particular, um, but in, uh, so the default mode network, the salience network and the frontal parietal network. But in particular, the default mode network seems to be particularly involved in uh, facilitating the um, psychedelic experience in, in that uh, its connections with other networks are impaired, you might say. Uh, or, or excuse me, are enhanced, whereas the connections within the network are reduced. So um, um, 
you get this paradoxical situation where the brain is hi more hyper connected in some ways, but in other ways, like with the topmost predictive models, the, those are sort of blasted. So, you know, insofar as the topmost models of the self are, are instantiated by the default mode network, those are sort of blasted. And the default mo mode network is drastically downregulated. Uh, but um, the salience network is sort of up upregulated, you might say. So um, again, you get the situation where somebody feels like they're getting intensely important, emotionally significant information coming in, but it's not being processed efficiently, and 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 so it takes months for them to process it. I mean, the standard the standard understanding of what's going on with a serotonergic psychedelic is that um, the topmost model, the self model, is being repaired. You know, the from a Bayesian point of view, we call the the, the uh, priors, the fixed priors of the model, are being updated essentially. But you, you first got to blast them to pieces, so to speak, and so the subjective experience is ego dissolution. It almost feels like a death. But then. But then the self is built up again, hopefully with more flexible priors, with a more flexible predictive model. Do you think that that would be uh, an explanation for why recently there's been some literature on the potential uh, positive benefits that psychedelics might have in conditions like depression? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, Obviously, one way to understand depression is very rigid priors. You know, like mm -hmm. a, um, they have a very rigid mind, mindset where everything is interpreted in, in negative terms. So if you can um, dissolve that, that set of very rigid priors and then replace them with more flexible priors, then that should help individuals. And from my understanding, there have been some clinical trials with serotonergic psychedelics in people with clinical depression, and it's it's that's precisely what's occurred. You know, they they um, they get better. So, yeah, I mean, there's not been long-term follow-up studies, but uh, so far so good. It seems. To, I mean, not not just with serotonergic psychedelics, but with um, ketamine and others as well. So there mm. seems to be a lot of promise there. Yeah, but, but no, but no, but that's what religion has done. This is what I've been arguing earlier. You know that in the past, what religion is typically done is upset or demodulate those Bayesian priors, the topmost model, the sense of self, and and then create a more flexible sense of self when it's operating correctly. What psychedelics seem to do is just uh, compress that whole process into a very short time period. Mm -hmm. So, from the perspective of neuroscience, what is a mystical experience? Of course, not necessarily induced by psychedelics. And I, I know, or at least as far as I understand it, it has to be interpreted as such by the people who experience it. But what is it? And does the brain in any way, at least in certain circumstances, facilitate it or not? Uh, yes, I, th I think the brain does. Um, I don't think you can have mystical experiences without brain, but um, <clears throat> I, I think that's an extremely important question for um, understanding religion, you know, trying to understand mystical states. And it's central to the psychedelic experience, it, it appears. And from an information theory point of view, if you take the predictive processing framework, for example, if you understand the brain as a predictive machine, then what it's doing is it's looking, it's going around looking for ways to surprise itself. Because it, what it wants to find is information. It, the most valuable information you can get is information that disproves your current hypotheses your current model about the world. Mm -hmm. So 
It's looking for information that surprises it. So it's looking to be surprised. So uh, how I discuss mystical experiences in the book is <clears throat> when you get the most intense form of surprise possible, when you come across information that utterly disconfirms your current topmost model in the predictive hierarchy, the sense of self. So <clears throat> the uh, surprise signal that you're getting tells you you've uncovered the most valuable information possible, the kind of information that disconfirms your current predictive model completely. So what do you do? You have to completely revamp that model. You have to let go of the, of the rigid priors that you've been living out of and create a whole new model. And the way to do that humanely, soberly, uh, step by step is by our standard religious practices. That's how it's been done traditionally. Um, <clears throat> nowadays we have therapy and other tools at our disposal where it can be done sanely, soberly, and step by step as well. So, um, But you get mystical experiences when you get that kind of surprise information, when that discon utterly disconfirms your topmost predictive model, because that blasts what everything you've known about the world goes out the window, mm -hmm. and and so you you have to see the world anew without looking at it through your previous point of view, your your previous priors, and so the world looks brand new. And that's what we call mystical states, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what happens specifically in near-death experiences? You get kind of a um, um, set of mystical um, experiences, and, and many of them. <clears throat> um, and uh, I think what happens is what we were talking about earlier. I mean. You, you have this overwhelming trauma. You almost died, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, you get the standard phenomenology people associate, now associate with near-death experiences. This is no longer like fringe science. This is very well documented now in, in many different surveys. There's a mm -hmm. set of experiences you get. Among them are mystical states. <clears throat> so you're, you're literally near death, but you don't die. Um, and you get the set of mystical experiences and and it transforms your life afterwards so um, from a neurological point of view I, I think the best explanations we have is uh, during the near-death experience what occurs is an eruption into wakings at that point of REM sleep processes so during uh, and and so you, you have these hallucinatory states that you generally have with REM sleep, but your body is paralyzed, which is what you have with REM sleep, and you have that tunnel vision and so forth. So the eruption into waking consciousness of REM sleep is, I think, can account for many of the features of near-death experiences. And, and note that I argue throughout the book that the eruption of REM sleep processes into waking consciousness is crucial for all kinds of uh, mystical experiences and religious experiences in general. And within the realm of transformational experiences in the book, you also talk about conversion experiences. What are these? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a central feature of um, many different religions. Uh, and, and it's just another instance of self-transformation. I mean, you and I have been arguing or talking about how uh, uh, religion can be seen as a neurotechnology, as a system of tools and doctrines and ideas and practices that helps to transform the self from um, a self that's relatively inflexible and non-adaptive and not not doing good predictions of the world into a, a more ideal self that meshes with the current uh, surrounding culture and religion 
and therefore allows for better in-group cooperation. So what a, what a religious conversion does is simply when a person wants to join a, a particular religious group, there's that sense of self, that predictive model, has to change from the old inflexible self to a new type of self with a new set of priors. And basically, that's what I think that what goes on with um, religious conversion. Mm -hmm. Uh, changing topics now, how do minds give rise to supernatural agents and gods? Mm. Um, well, um, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, ar I argue in the book, and as we've been saying earlier, I think supernatural agents are critical to understanding all types of religiosity. In many types of religion, there are very few religions that don't postulate supernatural agents. I mean, there's some forms of Buddhism that doctrinally claim they're not interested in supernatural agents, but most adherents still nonetheless postulate supernatural agents. So it's a f central feature of religion, so it, it needs to be understood. So um, there are many theories about how the mind produces supernatural agents. I mean, one theory is that supernatural agents are real, you know, and so we perceive them just like we perceive any any others. And there's some evidence from the psychedelic literature. I mean, in, in many psychedelic states, there's all kinds of entity encounters, which is incredibly fascinating because across individuals, across cultures, you tend to get the same type of entity encounters. So that's all interesting. But a standard way that... Um, um, cognitive scientists uh, try to understand the postulation of supernatural agents is uh, it's just sort of a hyper mentalizing at least that's the explanation like we, we tend to it's like an animism we tend to see agency everywhere and so we start to postulate supernatural agents now that's not adequate and most um, religious study scholars and scholars of religion agree that that's not adequate it's a part of the picture that supernatural agents come out of the fact that we see agency in minds everywhere because that's how our brains operate but it's not an ad adequate explanation because it wouldn't explain why um, we become so um, deferential towards supernatural agents and why we become so devoted to them or so fearful of them or so committed to them so we need a we need a better theory you know, to account for all those attributes of supernatural agents. But we're not there yet. Okay. And what are the sort of psychological effects that supernatural agents tend to have, the positive and perhaps also the negative? Um, well, at a group level, there's some evidence that um, be, because uh, most people think that supernatural agents can read your mind, you know, like it's said that they have full strategic access to your mental contents. So God knows what's going on in your mind. So if God can watch you constantly, then you're going to be on your best behavior. So that's one um, hypothesis, a supernatural punishment hypothesis, about how supernatural agents affect our behavior. If they, if they have these omniscient minds, then they can see what we're doing, so we have to behave a certain way or incur their wrath. So that's one way that they have a, you know, uh, an effect on our behaviors. There's many other ways, but... That's, that's so uh, asking about a very specific thing then, because this is something that we hear from many philosophers, anti-theistic atheists or anti-religion atheists and people like that, for example, the, the new atheists, we hear a lot of that from them, uh, about uh, anxiety specifically, because many people claim that in sort of a childish manner, people develop or create uh, supernatural agents, gods, whatever, to reduce anxiety and particularly existential anxiety but isn't it the case that at least in uh, in some cases the supernatural agents actually induce anxiety yeah I, th I think there's a lot of evidence that 
the old Freudian view of supernatural agents and the new atheist view of um, the way that they supernatural agents can help us control anxiety. All that's true. There's, that, to me, all that's true. However, as you point out, that's not the full story. Supernatural agents are much more complex than their effects on human behavior, much more complex than that. That's just part of the story. Terror management theory, for example, has mm -hmm. amassed a, a, an abundance of evidence for that. You know, that's the way religion operates. It helps to reduce anxiety. You know, so all that's true. I'm not saying none of that's true. However, um, it's not the full story because, as you just pointed out, supernatural agents uh, create intense anxiety in many people because they're watching us, because they're demanding all kinds of stuff from us. And the most spectacular set of cases is sacrifices. I mean, mm -hmm. up until just a few hundred years ago, many cultures literally beings or animals to the gods because they needed to placate these gods. The gods demand enormous sacrifices from human beings. So um, they don't, they're, they're not just comforting um, angelic uh, milk to toast uh, creatures, you know, they're, they're, they're ferocious demanding entities as well. So um, we need a much more complex theory of supernatural agents than what's been provided so far. Mm -hmm. uh, in what ways can neuroscience help us better understand rituals? What are rituals from a neuroscientific perspective? Um, well, I think um, there are many ways to approach that question. And some models, some um, neurobiological models of rituals um, come out of the study of OCD for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, because people with OCD engage in rituals, um, and we, we have a neurobiology of OCD, so you can start that way. Another way is to notice that rituals um, are rooted in what are known as stereotypies, motor stereotypies. So, um, when an organism is trying to reduce uncertainty, um, it, it engages in stereotypy. So it repeats behaviors over and over again until a source of uncertainty is reduced. And stereotypies um, also tend to occur in groups, so it sends a signal to another animal that this animal, the one engaging in stereotypies, is not threatening in any in any way so it's saying you can cooperate with me i'm not threatening i'm just engaging in this repeat behavior it's a display of non-threatening behavior and therefore i'm you know cooperate with me so um a lot of you know obviously human rituals and religious rituals are repetitive and and so it's, it's natural to model them as rooted in stereotypies. And when you do, certain um, um, brain circuits come up again and again that appear to be involved in producing these motor stereotypies and then the, the rituals, including like the mesocortical dopaminergic circuit and then the same three circuits we've been talking about this whole hour, you know, the salient circuit and the default mode network and the executive control network. So all those come up again in rituals. If I remember correctly, it was Harvey Whitehouse who developed the right. yeah. modes of religiosity theory to right. basically distinguish between what he calls doctrinal and imagistic rituals. So, and in the book, if I remember correctly, you also link that to, again, to sexual conflict and some sex differences. Could you tell us about that? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so imagistic rituals are, um, um, <clears throat> as described by White House, is, are things like ecstatic rituals, um, lots of panoply, lots of visual display, lots of emotion. Um, more epi uh, handled more by episodic memory, whereas doctrinal rituals um, are less imagistic and so forth, you know, so uh, um, 
Now, the way that's con connected to the sexual conflict stuff is uh, it's, it's just based on the fact that men versus women tend to form different types of groups. So uh, there's lots of theories about why that's the case, but um, evolutionarily speaking, um, for our species, women tend to disperse outside of the nat natal group to find mates. So they find themselves in a, in a situation where they're not among genetic relatives. So they're among non-kin in order to find a marriage mate. And so they're in a low trust situation. So they need to form coalitions, but with non-genetic relatives. So that they do that via imposition of um, group loyalty um, kind of rules, basically. Whereas males um, don't disperse out of the natal group, evolutionarily speaking, and so they, they find themselves able to create groups of high trust because they're among genetic relatives, and the kinds of groups that they wanted to create in ancestral um, states were, you know, hunters, basically, hunting parties. And these are what are known as task-oriented groups, so there's no hierarchy there. You get in the group, you skill sets are emphasized. So if you're good at butchering an animal or good at tracking an animal or whatever, whatever your skill sets, those are what's emphasized in male groups. Whereas in female groups, it's doctrine and it's rule following and it's loyalty tests because they're among non-kin, non-genetic relatives. So, so um, males, uh, so uh, the rituals that evolved in, and there's lots of ev evidence for this, that uh, they came out of male secret societies and most um, um, traditional uh, cultures and uh, societies have these male secret societies that form these types of task-oriented groups and and the kinds of rituals that emerge from them are sort of shamanistic ecstatic rituals with initiation rites and stuff like that whereas the kind of rituals that emerge from female coalitions are things that involve routinized dancing and um, group synchrony and group loyalty and this kind of stuff. So those two um, sex differentiated ritual types then get fed into White House's modes of rituals, it seems to me. They seem to fit in naturally with those two, you know, imagistic versus doctrinal um, ritual preferences. Mm -hmm. So uh, historically, uh, at least in certain monarchies, kings and queens have been attributed a certain, at least as far as I'm aware, contemporary monarchies do not operate exactly like that anymore. But uh, in those cases, could we associate kings and queens with supernatural agents? Yes, I think so. I think that's a, that's a data source that religious studies scholars have not tapped that well, it seems to me, because as I was saying earlier, most supernatural agents are disembodied minds, basically. But um, here we have a case where the supernatural agent was embodied, where literally kings, it was, and sometimes divine queens, but it was mostly divine kings. And these divine kings were li literally considered uh, divinities. And, you know, supernatural agents. They they were accorded the reverence, the deference, the rituals. They're surrounded by rituals, and they had enormous uh, supernormal powers, including right up until the modern age, the power to heal physical disorders simply via laying on of hands. So. Um, they, they were literal supernatural agents. And for most of human history from um, the, not the Paleolithic, but from the Neolithic period, say 15,000 years ago, 
up to maybe a few, maybe 500 years ago, kings were considered um, um, instantiations of the divine in a quite literal sense mm -hmm. and treated that way. And so it seems to me they should be a, a source of data for people interested in understanding supernatural agents, but they are, are often not studied. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the relationship between language and religion? Uh, that's another big question. Um, I, I think that, um, well, for, first of all, um, religious study scholars have looked at the special properties of religious language, like language used in religious context. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, you, when you analyze the, the language patterns you know, language used in religious contexts, you, you tend to see these, this, this decentering process occurring. So all of the markers of agency, for example, linguistic agency, like a thematic role um, assigning agency, even in a sentence, all these kinds of, these markers are, are uh, decreased. So if you look at a, you look at a corpus of, um, example of religious uh, uh, language, you know, hundreds of examples, and you, you, you linguistically analyze all, the, all these corpuses, you, you, you find over this uh, example that uh, the numbers of markers of agency are decreased, and then you get a, and, and then you, you can plot out this dynamic process, especially when, when the individual who is outputting the language is interacting with a supernatural agent, like say in prayer or something. You get you get the standard decentering process going on. So you get a decline in markers of agency, uh, linguistically speaking, and then over the over um, the dynamic process, you get a you, they start to um, rise again when uh, the individual is finished with the ritual. So, um, so religious language is marked by that decentering process. But then, on the broader speaking, language in general seems to set the bounds of thinkable thought in, in many ways. And um, religion tends to operate at the boundaries of thinkable thought and, and allows some individuals, some who are religious, in mystical states to cross that boundary into what William James called ineffable or you know noetic states where you get insight into ineffable you know barely perceivable ideas and concepts but that extends my argument is that pushes the bounds of thinkable thought forward so that's the opposite of what the new atheists thought about religion always constraining thought sometimes in mystical states it can it can push language into new conceptual areas now i grant the new atheist that most of the time it's it's probably garbage you know but sometimes it may not be garbage sometimes um we expand the horizons of language that way mm -hmm. so i think we've covered probably the main topics of your book. I have just one last question for you. Uh, earlier, when I asked you if you think that religion is a social phenomenon, you mentioned groupishness, the groupishness of religion. Uh, how does religion promote? Um, uh, um, it, it promotes a groupishness uh, because it allows for in-group cooperation and how group hatred. That's how I would summarize it. So it does both. So on the one hand, it makes everybody more loyal to each other within a group because you're all displaying these religious markers. Yes, yes, I totally believe. I'm a, I'm a fanatical believer in the doctrines of this religion. But then it also uh, helps you hate the outgroup, whatever the outgroup is. So it helps... You know, and, that, and sometimes you need that in a culture. You need to be able to fight wars, for example, sometimes. Sometimes it, it, it eventuates in atrocities, of course. 
So, you know, there's all kinds of bad things about religion, no doubt about it. But I, but I think um, religion promotes both, both uh, things, you know, in-group loyalties and out-group um, hatreds. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book is again the cognitive neuroscience of religious experience, the yeah. centering and the self. There it is, where people yeah. want to buy the physical copy of it. Uh, I, will, I will also be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Uh, Dr. McNamara, just before we go, would you like to tell people, apart from the book, where they can find you and your work on the internet? Um, I think there's a, there's a website called Cognitive Neuroscience of Religion that has a lot of my stuff. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, a lot of my books are on Amazon, but if you Google me, you can, can track me down. Mm -hmm. so, thank you very much. I really enjoyed, um, you had some great questions. Well, thank you very much for the kind words and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Same here, Ricardo. Thanks very much. Okay. So let me just for the kind words and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Same here, Ricardo. Thanks very much. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this episode until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there, starting at $1 per month. You also have links to PayPal. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arnold Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, o Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Unig, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adan Rosmani, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, and Sunny Smith. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.